Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to share the show. Tell a friend about the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. Spread the show. It's how we grow. And of course, use code CHSPODCAST at puritycoffee.com for the best coffee, if I may say so, on the planet. Uh, Today, we have show favorite, regenerative agricultural specialist, integrated pest management specialist, and so much more. Mary Beth Sanchez is back on the line. Hello, Mary Beth. Hello. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thank you for joining us here on the show again. My pleasure. I do love to talk about regenerative agriculture on this show. Regenerative coffee is kind of a huge part of what I do. Mary Beth, Mm -hmm. I was talking to some folks about pest control and uh, bio uh, pesticides, you know, biological controls. And I realized how we've never really, you know, dove too deep into this topic before. And I would love to do an exploration today talking about these pesticide alternatives, these biocontrols, these natural alternatives to harmful chemicals, um, and really do a deep dive on them today, specifically one that is used a lot in coffee. So you want to dive into biocontrols today with me? Oh, yes, I would love to. So I want to start like at the top, which is explaining exactly what I was just saying, maybe breaking it down for the, for the people who are uninitiated. Um, the difference between these chemical pesticides and how they work versus the biocontrols, the natural pest killers that we're talking about. Um, we don't want these chemical pesticides because what, Mary Beth, they work on neurotoxic levels. They work on mostly, yeah, levels. They're, yeah. Right. They're mostly nerve toxins, like, you know, developed in the world war as a, as a weapon. And, uh, you know, they found another use for it. And other ones are like stomach poisons and either one not necessarily great for human consumption. And most of those kind of things are often labeled that they are not supposed to be used for uh, crops that are going to be consumed. Sometimes they end up finding their way in there anyways, or they say don't use them towards the end of the plant's life cycle. But even that is a little bit sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. And then you find people don't read instructions a lot and they can get into trouble if they're not really, really, really careful in the application. And, uh, especially if you have drift and things, if they go into a stream, the toxic effects to the fish and the wildlife in the stream is usually really, really bad. Exactly. And so, you know, those kind of things, you just, it, you know, you have to be so careful with them. Is the risk really worth the benefit when you have these other options that aren't anywhere near so toxic? And exactly. they really are. Uh, effective they're natural in the environment they're just not necessarily enough of a population where you live so you may need to uh, support that population and help it to grow bigger better faster if it is really weak where you are some mm-hmm. particular bacteria or fungi that can do the job that those really toxic things were doing perhaps but Usually what happens is that the pests also build up such a resistance and tolerance to those poisons. It's one of the fastest things they do. Wow. And so, you know, they don't have as much resistance to uh, the bacterial things any more than we can, you know, give ourselves a vaccine for the common cold. It's just uh, certain things you can fight and certain things you can't fight. You can't fight a hammer hitting you in the head, but, you know, you can develop a resistance to certain poisons when you're exposed to them for a while. And boy, insects really seem to have this power. You you may have noticed, you know, that's the problem. We keep getting more toxic poisons because the pests get more resistance. The same with the antibiotics in our diet. You know how that goes. It, and they want to do these kind of things with plants, just overkill to the point that it's actually right. shooting ourselves in the foot sterilization you know? contributing to the sterilization as well that is uh-huh. a really good point um and to be fair a lot of this is being outlawed in the coffee industry um endosulfan was a product that was being used on coffee for a long time and it was bad uh. i mean really bad um famously oh. on this show we we covered the was it the colombian president or the brazilian president saying that endosulfan is a is a bigger threat to his people than the coffee borer beetle ever could be I um, believe you, honey. So, so, these people, you know, if they're working out there and they're putting them into the crops before the REI has sufficiently passed, and a lot of times they are, they're right. just saying, go ahead on back to work. It hasn't been enough time. 
That's true too. Yeah. So, so switching to these biological pesticides is, I mean, absolutely crucial for the health of the world and, and for the humans consuming these crops. And I do think we're headed in the right direction. Um, yeah. Uh, and like I say, they are so effective. You know, do we don't need to use those really toxic things when we have really not so toxic natural options? Right. It's like dropping a nuke on everything instead uh-huh. of just, you know, kind of doing a more tactical approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would love to focus in on one of these products. And I mean, this is a very, very common uh, biological application in coffee. I mean, it might be the most common one that I've seen on just about every uh, regenerative farm to to fight the borer beetle. Bouveria bassiana. Ah. This, oh, yes. uh, I want to say a, a fungus, one. but is it more of like a um, pathogen that comes from a fungus or, or a bacteria that comes from a fungus? It is a fungus. Okay. It, is a, it is a sort of, it's a fungus that when it takes over your body, it starts to grow its little you know, spore producing things outside of your body. But it 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 does that to the insects and they kind of look like they're kind of have moss coming out of all of the cracks and crevices of their body that like little white moss. Or, wow. And it really looks kind of interesting, but it that's the way it works to kill them from the inside out. But it's so effective and it does require contact. It does not require ingestion. So the bugs that walk through it can be affected by it. the bugs that eat it. You don't have to eat it. In, mm. in other words, to if you might not be uh, something that's eating it, you might not want to kill that bug. That's the only downfall of it because it, you might kill a bug that you wish you didn't. But it usually, you might you wouldn't be using that unless you had a reason to. And sometimes something has to be sacrificed. Sure. It doesn't kill absolutely everything in the in the ecosystem it's not like you're going to wipe out your and not see insects anymore but you will probably see a lot less of whichever one was really uh, an overwhelming problem wow. with the population like the boar beetle which at that point they're not they're oh, not concerned it really with, yeah. works good on beetles yeah and termites as well and thrips and white fly and aphids and grasshoppers it's one of the good things on grasshoppers because hardly anything is good on grasshoppers that one only requires contact. It doesn't require ingestion. Whereas the uh, the other thing that's good for grasshoppers is the Nosema locuste. It's they have to eat that for it to work for them. Whereas this stuff, it, it, if you put it where grasshoppers walk around, they're going to get it. So it's maybe better to uh, hit a grasshopper with that. Uh, and now that's the big problem with some of these pests, like like beetles, these boar beetles, like grasshoppers. They've got a they've got a shell. They've got an armor. That makes them very mm-hmm. resistant to pesticides really that try to yeah. Yeah, cook them up and, and, and fry them and stuff like that. Right. But these molds are insidious. They, they kind of, these, these, uh, these fungi, fungi, I should say, yeah. are insidious. They kind of get through that yeah. armor. Yeah. And usually insects are always trying to clean their bodies. And so it's these spores and things or these little bacteria or whichever that you're choosing. In this case, the Bavaria is a, a fungus. So you're getting spores and things all over you and you try to clean them off. And meanwhile, you're ingesting them. So you're really getting all that you're getting walking through it plus ingesting. So you're taking it home. And you know, when your other friends come and help you clean yourself off, (laughs) that is is insidious, man. But, um, Mm. you know, that's what we're after. We're after total destruction of these pests and, uh, what, no problem for the rest of the ecosystem, right? It's not an issue um, if, it's, it, if humans it are exposed to this, right? You, yeah, yeah. You're being responsible with it. Yeah, it's not. You know, if you're, I wouldn't like spray it on my beehive. Well, I've heard that it didn't hurt bees, but I sure Ooh. wouldn't spray them directly. I would, sure. you know, wait till they're not really active. Still, that's good though. That's mm-hmm. that's a very important thing that you just brought up. Uh, not harmful to yeah. pollinators, doesn't poison the water systems, none of those things, right? It's natural in the environment. Yeah, it's not considered a toxin. I mean, you certainly want to be following the precautions when you're applying it. You want to, you know, mask up and gloves and all that. You don't want to breathe a bag of these things, but it is really effective out in the environment. And it it really, uh, I have seen them do amazing things. And I know a lot of uh, people who have large crops. I mean, I'm talking, you know, hundreds of acres. 
they have used it with great success. Yeah, that, I mean, that's literally what I see, like I said, on every one of these farms. Again, if you want to look this up, and if you Google Bavaria bassiana, you find pictures that Mary Beth is describing, um, close-ups uh-huh. of insects covered in this stuff, showing you how it affects them. It's actually pretty cool. They're doing experiments just with mosquitoes. They're going to see if it can work on mosquitoes. I, I've heard it said so many times that I, I, I have to admit I typed in Bavaria. Like uh, the place uh-huh. in Germany. That's not how it's spelled. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's B E A U V E R I A, Bavaria, Bassiana, B A S S I A N A. And you'll find all sorts of research papers. You'll find cool pictures. Uh, and again, it is extraordinarily effective against this pest, the borer beetle, that just destroys millions and billions of dollars uh, in the coffee industry year after year after year. Um, Oh, in the natural forest, too, where we live with terrible problems with those beetles. And, uh, yeah, that's a, definitely an issue. They must love those little cherries. I bet that's, I mean, these borer beetles, when we started mass producing coffee, especially mm-hmm. before we had a handle on, I mean, they must have, just must have been a feeding frenzy. Um, they're everywhere. <sighs> they're all over the globe, these, these borer yeah. beetles. Somehow, I think our climate issues aren't helping us as far as the battling of the pests go. But we're, you know, we're not dead yet. We're still fighting. <laughs> uh, this is a good weapon in the fight. Um, I was kind of impressed by how it's created, just like you would kind of culture any other sort of, you know, like if you're if you're growing your own edible mushrooms at home or something. I right. guess they grow it yes. on cooked rice. That's pretty cool. That makes sense to me. Yeah, because uh, fungus loves those carbohydrate things. And there you go. That's rice is real carbohydrate. So it's easy to produce. It's not an industrial process or anything like that. They culture it on cooked rice. They dry it. And um, it's just incredible. It doesn't require any petroleum products. (laughs) Yeah, right? You know, and and neurotoxins. I just not. mm, The fewer of those in my life, the happier I think I'll be. That is really interesting. And this thing even says uh, this type of um, rice production might not be suitable for like huge, large scale industrial applications, but you can do it. It's good, good to do yourself. And it is really, really fascinating. The culture of the Bavaria Bassiana, the culturing of the Bavaria Bassiana, um, wild stuff. Again, you, you don't have to worry about, I don't, I don't uh, know about studies. We'd have to dig in deeper, but I know for a fact mm-hmm. that if this is certified to be used with uh organic certified coffee rainforest friendly certified coffee like you said as long as you're following the precautions this has to be extremely yeah. benign though those um, yeah those restrictions are very very strict they don't let you do anything uh with those re- those restrictions on coffee yeah that's you know definitely an ingestible so you have to be very careful uh, what else can you tell us about uh, Bavaria bassiana and other biopesticides like this? Well, there are others that work similarly that are in more like in the actinovate family. The, they're more in the streptomyces kind of thing. Uh, streptomyces species are normally the ones that look like a fungus. And they used to be classified as a fungus until they realized they really are a bacteria. That looks like a fungus, and and so they're very trippy because they actually do put out spores and what mycelium, but they're not the same kind of spores in mycelium that a regular fungus puts out. Like this is what Mycostop is made of, and it does work. Some and I do believe that you know if you made the investment, I don't think these things would fight each other if you had a Mycostop with uh, Bavaria bassiana because the Bavaria is mostly going to be used in the canopy part of your garden and the mycostop kind of products, the streptomyces, they're mostly going to be used in the soil part of your garden. And they're most going to be used for soil type diseases, you know, such as your pythium, your phytophthora, your mm. uh, rhizoctonia, your uh, 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 even PM actually. Oh, Verticillium. It's really good for those nasty, nasty, killer, uh, rotty things. I wonder if that These would do well against of... rust. I know po- coffee gets powdery mm-hmm. mildew. I wonder if it would do good against coffee rust. I bet it would. I bet it would. There's a uh, one called Streptomyces grisovarius and or, or Drisoviridis, and that one is the is the product that Microstock is con- uh, made of. And there's another one called. Uh, no, I'm gonna have fun pronouncing this, Raynutria 
Sacaliensis. <laughs> and that one is a, the regalia is the brand name for that. But it's another like biofungicide, but really good for killing the things that are going to get you from the roots up. And even those bacterial diseases, when you see those black spots on the leaf, that's usually a bacterial disease that's really hard to kill. So when these kind of products came out that actually can kill them, it's really, really a, a wonderful thing to have in the garden. And I do not believe that they interfere with the Bavaria product in any way if you were using them the same time. Yeah, in conjunction. <clears throat> it all does seem to work pretty well in mm-hmm. conjunction with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as chewing and sucking insects goes, there's also the uh, there's another species called Burkholderia. Uh, and it has a lot of species in it, excuse me. But it <clears throat> there's a specific strain that is in the product Venerate, and that is another one that's really good for, like, you know, if you have insects that are chewing and sucking, it'll kill them through uh, an actinomycete type of, uh, you know, a creature rather than a fungus-type creature. But it's a good thing to have in your soil. All these products uh, at Grand Devo is a chrome... It's a chromobacterium, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with Grand Evo, but it is also for these same kind of insects. And what it does is it stops their feeding, makes them sick kind of. It just kind of gives them like a something that's a stomach flu. It oh, wow. makes them stop eating, stop reproducing. It's also somewhat repellent to them. So if you put it out early, theoretically bugs won't come. But if they do come, they'll get sick. Wow. And that's... Uh, it's bio. Another thing about all these, yeah, all these products, they have to be applied well in advance of an infestation or something. It's something they're not going to work if you have, you see that you have a bunch of aphids, throw this at it. It's not going to work. It has to already be there and build up the population. So these are things that you would use in a regular routine program where whether you see a bug or not, early in the season, you're going to put these things out and they will be in your environment. They'll begin to grow. You want to put them where plants are because that's where the action is. You don't want to put them out in an empty field of just dirt. But um, put them where your plants are in the gardens and particularly around the edges where the uh, pests usually come from. But, you know, when you're talking about antifungal things, that that's probably going to be a lot of things in the soil that you're going to want to do a soil drench if you know that's an issue for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just did an exploration on coffee rust hitting South America. Um, was it the right. late 1800s when it put Asia on the map for coffee production because it, uh, South uh, America just got huh? smashed by that coffee rust? And and now, but they, something they like use actinovate, yeah, totally, yeah, actinovate would work. But that's another variety of a Streptomyces bacteria. It's different from the one in Mycostop, but they're both Streptomyces bacteria. And uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things that you can use in those situations that really. But they do uh, recommend in, in all their packaging that you put them on well in advance of any kind of problem. Let them let their population get established first. But if you have the, you know, your serious coffee grower and you've got some investment in your trees, it would well behoove you to want to put these things out in you know, the proper time of the season. Uh, let me ask you this, you know, another way that people control pests naturally is with predatory bugs and things like that. Now, oh, yeah. I know it doesn't work quite. I mean, maybe you can correct me. I know it's a little more challenging on a massive scale. Those types of massive releases can get costly is my understanding. Um, but just for yeah. sake of argument, are there any bugs that would go toe to toe with a beetle? Like, I, you know what I mean? I can't imagine there's some sort of bug you can release that would, that would be able to take down a a warrior type bug as, as a borer beetle. What you tell me. It would be another warrior beetle. <laughs> but <laughs> a bigger, no, tougher I, beetle. As, when it comes to those kind of things, the answer is you have to go small. Ah. If you were going to attack it with it, you would like go with nematodes, something right. like that, where that would get into their bodies and we couldn't have a defense against it because there's going to be a chink in their armor somewhere. And the nematode is good at finding chinks in the armor. As opposed to a smaller pest that would get gobbled up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can spray it right into the holes that are being bored. And that way those grubs and larvae in there can enjoy the effects of that. <laughs> enjoy the effects. Die, you little <laughs> bastards. Um, Have okay. some tea. Yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's why the biocontrols are good, I suppose. 
Um, hey, that's it. Because otherwise, you know, it, yeah. It's always warfare out there. It looks like a peaceful world. But between this bacteria and that fungi and that boring beetle and that tree, there's warfare going on. You know, Constantly. There are plants that put uh, te- chemicals out of their roots to kill plants next to them so they can have all the soil to themselves. Like, wow, you are so selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Soil hog, they, root zone hog. They can do this, you know, and like vines that will go up and choke their host to death. I'm like, really? You're going to kill your host? It this is, is the height of rudeness. <laughs> <laughs> it is very interesting. And I think it's even more interesting when humans harness these interactions where they go, oh, let's culture right. this fungus and then apply it to the whole field. It's such a better right. option than taking the uh, World War II era nerve gas yeah, and because, volatilizing you know, it's, it. You're you're going to be killing no matter what. Let's do it in the least toxic way, in the least dangerous way for the whole rest of the planet. You know, try not more. to kill us all when you take down that little thing that you <laughs> just couldn't put up with. I can't um, blame you. I think this was exactly what I was looking for, Mary Beth. This was a poignant exploration, really, again, showing the difference between a pesticide and a biocontrol. Really critical mm-hmm. for the audience to to understand because sometimes we, we blow over it, but a lot goes into it. Uh, again, finding the correct biocontrol that will work for your um, intended application and then, you know, resting assured that you're not poisoning the waterways. You're not making your crop more unhealthy. Uh, it is just a correct. form of nature that we're kind of harnessing for our own benefit. So, And you're not introducing you know, something terrible to the environment that is going to be a problem somewhere in the world. These are all things that have been here for centuries working for us, and we just need to, you know, like I say, culture them in a lab, get them commercially out there so that we can up the populations where they're more needed, where they're more lacking, and uh, you, you too can enjoy the benefits of uh, Bavaria <laughs> bassiana or Actinovate or <laughs> Chromium subjixuge. I love that one. That's a fun one. <laughs> Oh, Mary Beth, we love you. Latin. You're the best. Latin, we need more Latin in our lives. <laughs> I do find it a little bit challenging to memorize all these Latin names. So. It, yeah, I give up on it this way. I'll go with the brand name because most of them are patented. So you're only going to find it under that brand name more than likely <laughs> anyway. So good luck. And Makes it a little Bavaria. bit easier. Yeah. I think Bavaria is under a lot of different brand names. It's off patent now. But do encourage yourself to use these things. Just be careful in your application and do use them early. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love hearing from the master. I know everybody Aww. listening enjoyed this exploration. Uh, Mary Beth, we'll have you on again soon. Yes? Thank you, sir. We totally enjoy this experience. Awesome. Anytime. You're the best. Thank you, listeners. You're the best. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll be <laughs> back next week. And that's all for today. This is Mary Beth Sanchez and Jordan River signing off saying have an extraordinary day. We'll see you next time on the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast. (laughs) Bye-bye.